this is Farmer's Corner. We got a lot of serious stuff to talk about. Today. Steve, you look serious. Nancy, what's going on? We're on a road trip. And I'm not even sure where. <laughs> I'm not in on this planning committee. I'm just along as technical support, which is really pretty sad. Um, okay, I want to know why we're driving around. Why aren't we standing outside baking in the blast furnace, Steve? Well, we've got a lot to look at today. We've got crops under development. We've got corn, soybeans, alfalfa, all at different growth and development stages. And we're going to go out and take a look at those and see how they're coming along. We've got, it's hot today, it's 92 degrees, sunny, uh, not a lot of rain in the area this entire summer, so crops are in serious condition, but we've been getting some timely rains as we've been coming through the summer here. So we're going to take a look at some crops and see how they're doing. Fantastic. And uh, so everybody can get perspective. We're driving around in Steve's little hot rod mobile. And Steve, what are we driving? Toyota Prius. A Prius. And where where are we headed right now? Well, we're headed out towards Independence. We're heading west out of Whitehall now. So we're going to head out that Independence, uh, Pigeon area, um, Elk Creek, that area. Take a look at See what we find out there. It's the time of the season. Yeah. Yay. Well, it is July. It's supposed to be hot, right? It is, right. Yeah. 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 If it was cold in July, we'd have other we'd issues. We'd be complaining, yes. Right. Okay. Steve, I heard on uh, the radio this morning they were interviewing a farmer in North Dakota, and he grows a specialty type of soybeans that okay. they sell, like, to China and Japan for making tofu and such things and he was saying that they were having problems getting their their crop shipped that there was a uh, either a shortage or some kind of a snafu in getting it into those big uh, containers okay. shipping containers and on the ship and over there and then back again and you maybe heard something yeah I hadn't heard about that but um, I know I know of the company that does some of that shipping or a company that does some of that shipping and because it's smaller amounts they ship them in shipping containers instead of just the big bulk freight ships and um, so yeah you can contract for some of that stuff and you get a, a premium price for your soybeans because they're going for more of a food grade um, type market but so ooh. you're saying that there's farmers around here that also raise them for this tofu and yeah. specialty yep. type thing yep Yep, there are some of that. So we're going to pull in here and take a look at some drought-stressed corn. So this is a hay harvest operation going on here in the distance and they're chopping with a self-propelled chopper into trucks and this works real well hauling feed long distances and it's actually safer than pulling wagons with a tractor down the road because hopefully the trucks have good rear view mirrors and turning signals and all that good stuff working and so they're able to move down the road at close to highway speeds and, and move this crop to storage and get it up in good quality. So this kind of getting to be a normal scene around Trempolo County. But that takes a real knack to be able to drive the truck at the right. <laughs> right, yeah, you've got it you've got to pair up the speed, the distance from yeah. the chopper and, and that, that type tricky. of stuff. So <laughs> right, there's some skill involved there. there. Is. Right. Right. You don't just grab any old 
person off the street and have them drive silage truck yeah. for you. Yeah, that so, is so right, mean. right. And then to get the right number of trucks paired up with the chopper and everything, and to get that so that the chopper isn't sitting there waiting. Those are those choppers are expensive machines, yeah. and you yeah. want to keep them moving, utilize them as as much as you can. Oh, so, yeah. yep. But so. And here comes a tractor with a with a forage box on behind it, and uh, so that that will go up there and get filled with with chopped hay also. So this hay is chopped. It's it's not dry like it would be for baled hay. It's it's wet. It's well high moisture, and then it would get packed into probably a bunker silo, and uh, it'll ferment for cattle feed different fermentation process than what we use for making alcohol. There's hopefully very low yeast counts in this feed because yeast will actually make animals sick and it's the yeast that produces the alcohol as a byproduct of their fermentation. So it's fermented, it lowers the pH of the, of the feed and then it's able to be stored for long term similar to making sauerkraut so yeah, it's, cool. it's like sauerkraut, sauerkraut for, cattle. for cattle right right um, so we've got a dry season going on here and i'm standing in a field of soybeans now and uh, the soybeans if you look at them they're not the nice dark green that we would like to see in a soybean field um, this time of year two reasons for that well multiple reasons could be and i think we've got multiple reasons in this field and I don't know the history of this field to know what herbicides have been applied to it but if you look down lower in the in the plant canopy we have some some speckling and bronzing and crinkling on these leaves that may have been from a herbicide application that temporarily injured the plants also when a plant is under drought stress <coughs> it will be less than dark green just as because the photosynthesis is slowed down it doesn't have as much chlorophyll in it also we have a crop pest present here it's called two spotted spider mites and so I'll just demonstrate how you can scout your crops for this pest this is a pest of soybeans and other crops but primarily soybeans that we tend to have more of in dry conditions because under wet conditions there's fungal um, problems that occur that that affect the the spider mites but they'll build up under dry conditions so the way to scout for for these is get a piece of either white paper or if you had a white board or something you could use that but paper's obviously easy to get Hold that underneath the, the plants and you slap the plants and then you look and you can see, ah, I'm not seeing any move here, but you can see, yep, there's some moving and uh, you need a hand lens, a magnifying glass to properly identify them, but you'll see they're, they're moving around and they are really, really tiny, but they're, they're sap feeders, so they feed on the sap of the soybean plants. And we need to have a certain number of, of uh, two-spotted spider mites per plant in order to justify a herbicide application. And we've got to be very careful when we apply, or not herbicide, insecticide. We've got to be very careful when we apply insecticides to a field um, because we can kill off all of the beneficial insects and then that will cause a resurgence of the spider mites. So if we're not at treatment level or threshold and we come out and make an application because the beans don't look healthy, um, we could exacerbate the problem. So we want to make sure that first we have the two spotted spider mites present and that we are at a proper timing of the, of the application. So another pest we have out here are Japanese beetles. And you can see those, these lovely things and the damage they do. Right here's one. We got two of them on this leaf, one on the top side, well two on the bottom side. And they are skeletonizing these soybean leaves here. <clears throat> so this is uh, 
a pest that it's an invasive species it's not native to the United States and it causes some damage in our soybean fields and other crops but generally not at levels this field although we have them in here is not at treatment level we would need about 40 percent defoliation before it it pays to treat these so and there again we come in with an insecticide to kill the Japanese beetles we're also killing the beneficial insects and then we could uh, set ourselves up for an explosion of the two spotted spider mite so we've got to be careful when we're when we're applying these insecticides that we're not doing more harm than good so exactly what harm does the beetles do the japanese beetles yeah, yeah. they eat the they 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 eat the 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 leaf uh -huh. and they leave it skeletonized or or lacy like this yeah. so it's just they're reducing the the factory the photosynthetic oh, okay. factory okay. that's out there so that could affect <coughs> the beans it will affect it could affect yield if you get enough defoliation uh -huh. now what happens with plants is these top leaves here in this plant are doing the majority of the photosynthesizing and the lower you go down in the plant the less just for one reason is they're just not getting as much sunlight so if we take these top leaves off of the soybean plant the leaves lower in the canopy will just pick up more of the work so that's why we can lose you know 40 percent of the leaf area out there and they'll keep churning out yield and so how long will those Japanese beetles stick around what's their they've got about another three to four weeks and then they'll they'll they lay eggs so they'll lay eggs in the ground usually in a turf area lawn area road ditches into a sod where they're not going to be disturbed they hatch out and into a white grub a white grub worm those grubs will feed for a little bit here in the fall and then as the soil starts getting cold and freezing they'll just move lower into the soil to escape that frost line then in the spring when the when the ground thaws they move up to the surface and they continue feeding on the roots of the grasses out there and then in July they pupate and uh, or form a cocoon and then they they pupate into the beetle and then that's the annoying part that we see that's that's out there they'll also feed on raspberries they really like raspberries and fruit trees apple trees that type of stuff they they're really a destructive pest so I have them on my raspberries I also have them eating my zinnias <laughs> okay Not the flowers sure but the leaves and I can't see that so far has made any difference to the flowers well yeah and so you can lose a lot of foliage a lot of leaves and not really affect okay. you know a, a lot of yield um, so if you're going to use the pheromone traps for the Japanese beetles make sure you keep those traps a couple hundred feet away from the the plants you're trying to protect so if you've got them in your raspberries for example do not put traps in your raspberries it seems logical well I want to yeah. trap them but that pheromone attracts them so it's it's a pheromone for breeding so they think oh I'm gonna go find a mate you know so I'm gonna go to this pheromone well then they hang out around it and wait for their turn to go in there and as they're hanging out they're having some lunch so okay. you need to put those traps a couple hundred feet oh. from anything that you don't want damaged I see. so sense. yeah so the, the problem is in a in a town or a village you know you lots are rather small so in order to get it, you know, a couple hundred feet from your apple tree, you need to put it next to your neighbor's apple tree. That may not be a good idea, <laughs> okay? So that may be frowned upon. Uh, Is there any kind of uh, animal or bird that eats those beetles? No, and they that's... can't go and get geese or anything and have I, Yeah, them. maybe they'd eat it, but that's a problem <laughs> with invasive species. Yeah. We bring the invasive species, we don't always bring the predator or the disease because in Asia, these beetles really aren't that big of a problem because there's diseases that affect them and there's other predators and stuff. It's the whole ecosystem. Right. So we're, they're out of their 
element here right, and they, they just thrive missing from the system right yeah. right so um, another thing I want to show on these soybeans is this time of year we're in the reproductive stage or, or pod filling stage so we've got soybeans are non-determinant plants so uh, or the soybeans we grow here in Wisconsin are non-determinant so we've got flowers and pods on the same plant. Now if we we're down in Louisiana they grow a determinant soybean. This plant is also growing height at the same time so this plant will continue to grow if we get if we get moisture. Down south they grow a determinant soybean. What that means is you grow the plant and then it stops growing, it flowers, it fills, sets pods and fills pods. So we've got all three going on at once here. Um, so this is a very critical time here because we're flowering, we're filling pods. Now soybeans are remarkable in their drought tolerances in that they'll, they'll stop flowering if it gets too dry and then if it rains they'll resume flowering. So sometimes you can end up with a blank spot in the soybean plant where you'll have pods down low where they had moisture blank spot with no pods because it was too dry then it rained and you'll get some more pod fills. Um, <clears throat> I got one more quick question yeah. for you. <laughs> My in-laws farm down in central Illinois. Okay. Was born corn yep. soybeans. Okay a couple years ago I was down there and their soybeans were so tall they were up to my chin. I mean, I know I'm a short person, sure. but even so. Yeah. And I was wondering, was that desirable if, if you're putting that much energy into growth? Well, yeah, because you're building that big factory. Okay. <clears throat> You've got all that photosynthetic area out okay. there. So yeah, it's it's desirable from the standpoint that you've got a lot of photosynthesis going on. It's undesirable from the standpoint that they can lodge, fall over, and yeah, be hard yeah, to, yeah. to cut. And I've seen soybeans around here that have been at that height also. Good soils, good growing conditions. We're probably not going to see it this year unless we get you know a change in rainfall here. Um, but yeah, these soybeans can get quite quite tall and thick and tangled and, and everything. Yeah, yeah, Illinois soybean yields are, you know, 80 bushels yeah. per acre and ours around here are 40 to 60. Yeah. So it it just depends on the on the year we're having. So but yeah, so these beans are at a critical point for moisture and, and so is the corn around the area. So we're gonna go look at some corn. We're, we've got a field of late planted corn with some drought stress that we can look at. Okay, we're gonna walk down. <laughs> okay, uh, so we are in a late planted field of corn here. Um, I don't, here again, I don't know the history of this field, but I suspect this field, it was alfalfa. This field probably had a first crop of hay taken off of it and then corn no-tilled back into it, uh, which is a good practice for a livestock farmer, a person with cattle because they get a, a hay cutting and then this late planted corn is probably intended for corn silage so they can up the ton per acre yield of, of forage off of these fields. One of the biggest drawbacks is drought stress because this alfalfa crop was growing out here it pulled moisture from the soil and the corn was planted back into it. The, the alfalfa was terminated with herbicide but as it was growing and regrowing it drew moisture out of the soil. Um, now we've got this drought stressed corn crop out here. We can tell it's drought stressed because it's wilted. The leaves are, are curled up. That's a self-defense mechanism of the plant. It's, it's reducing the, the leaf area that's open to the sun and the wind for, for evaporation from the leaves. Um, it's called evapotranspiration is the big scientific term. 
and there's holes in the leaves or stomata um, so the, the plant respires or breathes through those holes. Technically plants don't breathe because they don't have a diaphragm and lungs, only living animals breathe. But if we think of it like breathing, there's these holes in the leaves or stomata where for gas exchange, taking in, you know, carbon dioxide and oxygen from the air and releasing carbon dioxide and oxygen um, back out into the air. So when it's dry, the, the plants close up those stomata to conserve moisture that's in the plant. Um, plants will release water back into the air also to help cool the plant because this plant tissue can get very hot out here in the sun. With, with all the sun shining on those dark green leaves. So they'll pull moisture up through the soil and, and release it out to reduce the temperature of those leaves. So on a very hot day like we have today, it's 92 degrees, it's quite windy. We've got a lot of evaporation coming off of these, these plant leaves, but not so much off these closed up ones because they're trying to conserve moisture and keep the plant alive. Like I said, it's a self-defense mechanism. If this plant did not release, or did not curl up, the plants would release so much moisture back into the air that they would actually die and just dry up. So if this crop gets rain, you know, so far we're not turning brown on any of the leaves, then we should, you know, this plant, these plants should recover and resume growth in a, in a fairly normal process. But, but this is just another example of our dry conditions here. So Now, Steve, <coughs> where do we sit with the overall picture of uh, drought across Wisconsin right now? So the, there's two areas of, of dry. Um, so extreme dry is up north, up Superior Douglas County up there. They're extremely dry. And also southeast Wisconsin down that Milwaukee Racine area down there. Here they say we're moderately dry. But we're right but on that cusp. We're right on that cusp. If we don't get rain here in the next, you know, three days, four days, we will be, you know, it, it will be hurting the crops. It will go to severe. <laughs> we could. Yeah. Yeah. So if we look at the at the, the rainfall statistics, um, Eau Claire is like two inches below normal rainfall for the season, which doesn't seem like a lot. La Crosse is a half inch below normal, is do, all. Do those take into account our deficit of snow over the winter time for recharge? Well, it's the year. It's from January 1 to okay. uh, those those numbers were like five days old now as we're filming this. Um, so yeah, it does take into account the, the deficit of snow, but you got to keep in mind, you know, depending on the moisture of the snow, a foot of snow is only maybe an inch of water, Right. you know, right. so we don't re get a lot of precipitation j in January and February. And we so. had an exceptionally long dry fall. We did. Yep. And so so, so our, that doesn't help either. Right. So we had dry soil going into the winter with not much snow cover, froze the soil, so any melting that occurred fall, winter, spring ran off. So yeah, we were just compounded here. But another thing to keep in mind too is Eau Claire at the airport, they can say, well, we're two inches below normal. But the rains have been so spotty this year right. that five miles away they could be five inches below normal. Right. So it 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 really you know it what they get in Eau Claire and La Crosse really doesn't matter. Right. But what, it's kind of a benchmark. What you get on your farm or in your yard. Is exactly. Like yeah. 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 And now you know, like we said, when we were in the soybean field, they're at a critical stage right now. Yeah. And so is the corn, as the corn's tossing. This is a late planted field, but the, the corn that was planted on time is all tossing and pollinating. Super critical time for the corn. To get rain. To get rain. So if-, if The form, the cob. The cob. So if that field picks up, you know, a half inch of rain as it's tossing and pollinating, and a field down the road doesn't get that half inch of rain, that makes a world of difference right, right. there. So right. It, it's, it's really a critical time right now to get rain. So what else has been happening in ag? It's been a little while. I think the last time we were together, 
We were, where were we again, coats? We were wearing coats. It was kind of a cold, cold, cold windy day. We were standing next to Henry's Lake in Blair. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We had a lawnmower helping us. Right, right. That's right. Right. So, yeah, we've had a lot happen. Um, crop prices have strengthened. Um, a lot of just really weird stuff going on. Well, um, nothing, we, we no longer have like a cycle. I mean, the weather is not obeying the weather cycle. Right, the right. Crop prices are not following the crop cycle. The beef and the dairy, well, I, and the hogs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yanni Kohani. I mean, there's crazy stuff going on. Yep. And. Uh, but with, with crop prices, nine years out of ten, we get the highs for the season are around that May time frame, like planting season. That's right. when farmers should be emptying their bins and or booking the new crop for harvest to sell off the combine. One year out of 10, the, the prices peak late in the season as harvest is occurring because we've had a drought or something and they're like right. oh my gosh we, we don't have as much grain out there as we, we thought are. we did so we need to really bid it up so but now in 2020 with the covid that was just a total market disruptor right nobody knew what was going to happen or why it was going to happen so it just really threw demand for everything just cattywampus right um, so as we got into harvest in the fall our prices started to rise and they continued to rise after harvest and so we've got areas of exceptional drought in the United States. So we've got a lot of states that are burning. People. North Dakota and South Dakota are very dry. Minnesota is quite dry. So here in Wisconsin, we're actually doing pretty good compared to a lot of Minnesota. Right, right. Um, Iowa is dry. Now Illinois is good. They're getting timely rains and good rains. So from Illinois east in the Corn Belt, they're they're doing quite well. Iowa West dry. Yeah. So where this market's going to go, I don't know. New crop harvest price is still five dollars plus, which is right. very good. Right, right. Very good. Right. At least that's closer to that cost of production. Uh, yeah, cost or of production Brickian? plus. Oh, it's it's cost of production plus. plus. It so if a farmer gets a decent yield this year, they should be able to turn a profit. But it, at this point, it all comes down to yield. You know, well, so if yield we, and weather. If we, yeah, if we don't get those timely rains, it doesn't matter if it's ten dollars. Right. You know, the the person's looking at crop insurance. And so. now, because of the drought issues, it seems like everybody's starting to start looking for hay. Right. Potentially seeding in a summer annual. Yep to yep. fill the gap, although we're pretty much on the cusp of that. If you're going to plant it, it should be in the ground and grown by now. Right, right. Um, but so we may be looking at rising, rapidly rising hay prices. We could be, yeah. So around here we've had a decent first crop, second crop hasn't looked too bad. It's it's down, but not, not too awfully bad. But now the, the weather for the next week is going to be in the upper 80s to mid 90s for temperatures, and we've got some 40, 50 percent chances of rain out there. If it's that hot without much rain or any rain, third, third crop be would, be, would be skinny. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, we could see some rising hay prices. We haven't really seen it too bad yet. A few stories of people selling some of that, that grassy hay type stuff for the horse market where they've been snatching that up quick right and th those prices have been high but well, so far the, nothing uh, too high a lot of those buyers don't have the alternative of saying okay i'm going to make an extra field of corn silage right and as we get closer and closer to corn silage which is only a few weeks away if you look at the calendar it's about six eight weeks away yep right and that's right go by like that right Right. Um, if it continues to stay dry, then we have a whole other host of issues right. that we have to talk about. 
right. in harvesting that silage higher up on the stalk. To avoid nitrate poisoning. Definitely. Right, right. Yep, yep. So leaving a higher stubble. And then also it depends on how successful pollination is. So if we get a successful pollination where we've got a decent cob out there, then we want to let that corn stand as long as we can and try to fill as much of that grain as we can. Not only does it increase dry matter, it increases digestible energy out there and just makes an all around better feed. If we unsuccessful pollination, no grain out there, you can chop that field whenever you want. And then that could free that field up for either a, a late summer oat planting or rye or wheat, you know, for an for a early spring harvest of some forage or a, a fall grazing right. if, if right. a person wanted to. Well, and a lot of folks have may not be aware that forage oats are now back on the scene. Right. I mean, forage oats was something that was, you know, in favor 50, 60 years ago, sure. 70 years ago. Sure. Now it's back on the scene. You can get that fall crop. Mm -hmm. Whether you plant it, let it freeze and die, then you have the ability to no-till something right into that, that it, stubble. Right. Or you can yep. graze it off, or you can wrap it up for baleage. Yeah, and the, the thing about planting oats, so if we plant oats from, you know, today, we're, what, 22nd of July when we're filming this. So you planted oats today, the day length is getting shorter. Yeah, I mean, you know that. I notice it at night. I come I in from from in the working in the working in the garden. I'm like, yeah, I'm inside. Yeah. And it's getting dark. It's only eight thirty. Um, but so as our day length gets shorter, the, the we, we're fooling the oats. We normally plant oats in the spring, and it's growing as day length is getting longer. Right. So oats flowers based on day length or heads. That's a flower. So as a day length is increasing the oats is growing as soon as we cross that threshold about June 22nd and the days start getting shorter the oat plant says I'm gonna pop ahead I'm yep. gonna make some grain and then the plant begins to lay down a lot of fiber in the stem to hold up that heavy grain head well in, when we plant oats now it grows and the days are already getting shorter and it confuses the oats it confuses those plants they, they might still pop ahead out but right. they will not pollinate and they will not lay down fiber in that stem and it so makes we've got really nice feet we've got hollow stem hollow seeds out there and then the plant is still photosynthesizing and in any plant the photosynthesis goes from source, which is the leaf, to sink, which is the, the ear or the seed head or the growing tissue. So that's where those sugars flow. So that oat plant doesn't have a sink. So it just keeps churning out sugar and it just accumulates in the plant until it just clogs up the plant. So you've got this low fiber, high protein, high sugar feed out there. So if we can get some oats planted, take off some of this drought stress corn silage if it doesn't pollinate, chop it, get it out of the way, start getting some timely rains. Oftentimes when we have droughts around here, it's early or late season drought. Right. And then we end up with some rain, you know, later, later on. on. So plant that oats and then you get kind of that super feed that you're harvesting in October, November time frame. Right, right. And, and you know, it really <coughs> opens up a possibility to get probably a little bit of extra feed to get you through. Right, um, right. And they can take it cold. Yeah. I mean, they can take very, very cold temperatures. They can even actually take a relatively solid freeze and I think it's because they're full of sugar the, right they don't right freeze like right they're full of sugar and oats is just tolerant to cold temperatures yes. anyway because we planted early in the spring and we've all heard stories or seen it ourselves of oats that was sprouted up out of the ground got six inches of snow the snow melted and man it went gangbusters yeah well that's all that free so. nitrogen exactly you get a lot yeah. of free nitrogen yeah. from snow so the the biggest thing with that late planted oats is that you just you want to it, it can stay out there and 
stay out there almost forever right but you don't want that heavy snow on it that's going to pack it down to the ground especially if you're going to mechanically harvest it well because they you, it won't have the lignin to, to, hold, to, it, to, to hold it up to sustain a snow right yeah. right and then it's packed down tight to the ground and you have a hard time if you're going to graze it the cattle will still graze it right but if you're going to mechanically harvest that so you kind of want to be done you know around here you know before deer season because that's right. when about late November is when we start getting those snows and that type of stuff so and hopefully this year we'll get snow hopefully we will so those are some things to consider but so what else has been happening in the neighborhood anything fun and exciting there was a very very successful Trumplow County Fair there was right right yeah and we talking to one of the fair board members they had record gate attendance. Um, exhibits were down. Um, part of it, I think, is just, you know, everything opened up and families are going to weddings that were postponed and family get-togethers they couldn't have last year and everything. And then there might have been a little bit of, you know... A, hesitation? A, hesitation. Some of those projects aren't put together until, like, the night before the fair. So. And this year we haven't even opened a book. Yeah, so... so you know well gee last year we put together you know three or four projects or we were going to and then the fair was canceled so uh, you know yeah so i i hope that's what it was and i hope next year we have a lot more exhibitors and stuff but well and we have to we, we have to still keep in our brains we've got something floating around out there that's right. changing itself up a little bit yep Yep. And so, you know, we still have to kind of maintain a little more care yep. when we do things. Right, um, right. And then hopefully we won't have an experience like the last time. Right, right. Maybe we can prevent yep. that. I know there are some states that are really, really struggling with rising numbers. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin is rising as well, but not no. at the rate. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know, we were latecomers to the COVID game. We were. Wisconsin we were. really didn't get sick until 4th of July going into Labor Day. Right, You know, right. and so we, luckily we were spared. Yep, But yep. in, I think, everybody's life, we know someone did not fare out as well. Right, And so right. we're glad to see as many people as we can see safely. Right, right. And, and it's, you know, and hopefully we learned from this too that, those of us that work in offices or factory settings, whatever it is, you know, if, if you're sick, stay home. Yes. And hopefully employers out there are like, yeah, if you're sick, stay home. We don't need the whole workforce sick, whether it's a common cold or seasonal flu or well, God yeah, forbid because COVID. because that's something else that's coming down the line. Right, right. And, you know, so we don't need to be heroes and show up when we're on death's bed for for work. Yes. You know. Because now we all have figured out that we can do it at the click of the button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's 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 and cough into and your cough, own container. Right. And and yeah, there's some jobs we can do from anywhere with the click of a button. There's some yes. you need to be present. But hopefully, you know, we can figure out how to get through these seasonal colds and flus without the whole workplace getting infected. Definitely. So, Definitely. Right. Things have changed. Well, let's take a look at some corn that's a little bit more mature. Right. And, right. And uh, we'll see how that looks for stage of development. Right. So we're going to Let's mow Yep. Okay. Yeah. Here's um, slugs. Right here is slug damage. Right here. This from when it was wet, I suppose. Yeah, and then the slugs would be down under this this grass here, living in the grass, maybe even before it was dead, down in this low spot. So this, right here by my thumb, is slug damage. Can you get down in there? Oh, she can't hear me. So the, right. slugs, the slugs would be down under this, this grass here, maybe even before the grass was dead. And then they feed, they just skim across the top and take the very top layer off of the leaf and leave these, these little trails like this. You can get to a point where slugs can damage the crop enough to really hurt yield. Typically what happens in Wisconsin is our springs are colder and wetter and conducive to slug growth. 
once it gets hotter and drier then the slugs are they go dormant or die and they don't damage the crop but but that's what what slug damage looks like in field corn yeah right yeah road kills oh no chicken poop. oh yeah chicken but um Okay, so the uh, nitrogen rate test plot is, uh, I'll wait till Nancy's done kicking my garbage around. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, so the nitrogen rate test plot we're going to is a corn plot designed to look at corn response to, to nitrogen rates. So we go from zero pounds of nitrogen per acre up to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, we've done this now three years. It's a statewide effort. And uh, so there's test plots in Buffalo County. Those are, that's what I'm aware of here in Trumpelo County. There's 11 different sites around the state with other county agriculture agents. And there's some plots at Arlington and Lancaster as well on the state's main experimental farms. Also, there's a plot or two up at Spooner on the uh, ex Spooner Experimental Station. So what this is helping us do is look at modern hybrids and how they respond to nitrogen and trying to pick an optimum nitrogen rate for corn. The theory out there is that we're now routinely growing corn yields of 200 bushels plus per acre. The theory is that it takes a pound of nitrogen to produce a bushel of corn. So we are either proving or disproving that theory. Um, so far, the data from the plots that have been in Trempolo County shows that we maximize corn yield somewhere in that 120 to 160 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So, and the, the corn yields have been 200 bushels plus in these plots also. So that's what we're determining. I was out at this plot two days ago and we can see a difference in, uh, in nitrogen rates in the, so we, so we go from zero pounds of nitrogen per acre, we go zero, 40, 80, 120, 160, and 200 pounds of nitrogen. So we can see the difference. We can see the, the zero pounds per acre and the 40 pounds per acre. Um, visually, it's hard to detect where the 80 is and, and on up. So, so our, depending on the weather, you know, we may see a difference, you know, if, if we don't get rain, it turns hot and it's just a lost crop, there was no response to nitrogen because we didn't get any grain yield from any of it. So we've got to wait to see how this season pans out. Um, but typically the response to nitrogen is determined by the weather, rainfall, temperature, an extremely wet cold year you get no response to nitrogen an extremely dry hot year no response to nitrogen because they're both years are not conducive to corn yield um, it's the in-between years where we start to sort out a response to nitrogen so so Steve is kind of the end goal of this to say okay no it doesn't really pay to put 200 bushels a hand or 200 pounds a hand it's more appropriate to put 120 yes uh, in a nutshell yeah we're trying to find out what is the appropriate rate of nitrogen um, so the upper midwest universities wisconsin minnesota iowa illinois ohio um, and michigan we are in a, uh, it's called Martin, Maximum Return to Nitrogen uh, program. And there's, there's a website out there where you can put in your soil data and uh, that and you'll come up with, a, a, so soil data, price of nitrogen, price of corn, and you, you'll, get, um, you'll get a nitrogen rate. So we're just reinforcing that information. So, 
So that effort took data from all of those states, crunched it around and looked at it and, and came up with this formula. So, so that's what we're trying to do is just either reinforce or throw out that approach. Um, so which wherever the data takes us is where the nitrogen rate recommendations will go. Um, where and when this research effort stops or slows, I don't know. So it's like I said, it's been ongoing for three years and um, we'll see where it goes from here. Some of the, some of the plots around the state were non-responsive. Some of them, you know, uh, other than the zero rate, which yielded a little less, um, there was no difference in 40 to 200 pounds of nitrogen. Um, so it, it just depends on where they are, but that's what we take into account. We say, okay, sometimes there's no response to nitrogen. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of nitrogen to yield a response. Uh, you know, other times there, it's a nice linear step where we continue to get a response right on up to 200 pounds. There were some plots around the state that, that it was a linear response. As they put more nitrogen on, they got more yield. So that's something that the, the data analyzers are crunching out of the numbers. And the more site years we get, the more data we get, the more that starts to shake out and take place around the state. Well, and I think ultimately we have to start looking at the amount of contamination in our groundwater so that we're not wasting, really wasting the dollar. Right. Because it costs the farmer dollars to apply nitrogen. Right. And you don't want to apply too much. You know, it's that old adage, if an ounce is good, a pound is better. Right, right. And uh, kind of want to get away from that. Yeah, and also, as we understand more that, and I had a few older people tell me that at one point when commercial nitrogen was first becoming available in the 50s and, and that, that time frame, that um, and it was cheap that they were like well you kind of need two pounds per bushel of expected yield and so it was all over the board you know so we have as we understand more we have moved in the right direction you know we've just got to continuously take steps to improve our understanding of it Where are we? so the test plot is starts right inside this field here My mother-in-law from uh, horror stories of small children lost in huge cornfields. Yeah, yeah. And the corn sucked all the air out of, you know, all the oxygen out of the air. Oh, I think they probably died of heat stroke and <laughs> panic, but, <laughs> you know, mother-in-laws can believe what they want. Yeah, so. so, here we are in this cornfield. Um, sure picked a nice, hot, humid day to be in a cornfield that's pollinating. We can see here on the leaf this dust here is, is corn pollen. Here's a, the pollen sacs are coming off of the tassels. So this uh, corn plants, the flowers are split in two. So we've got the, the male up on the top of the plant as a tassel that produces the pollen. And we've got the female half of the flower here in the ear with the silks. And so each silk or little hair in here needs to have a pollen grain land on the end of that of that silk and then the pollen grain burrows down into the into the the ear and we can take that apart and we can look at how how that's pollinating and now in order to assess pollination, we husk the ear upside down, basically, and we take off. If we just rip it, we'll rip the silks off of the kernels, but we go into upside down like this, very carefully remove one husk at a time, if we can, if time allows us as we're filming here. But this, this is a technique that farmers can use, home gardeners can use this in their sweet corn to see how, how well pollination has occurred. And um, 
the, the, the husks get thinner as we go down through the ear here so you got to keep being careful as we go and you can see here how these have detached from the kernels so each one of these little blisters is going to be a, a kernel eventually if it's pollinated successfully and I'm getting down here down towards the end of it And then if I have been sufficiently careful, we'll be able to tell where pollination has occurred and where it is yet to occur on this cob. And we let there. So we can see we've got some kernels down here at the butt of the cob that have not pollinated for whatever reason. These silks are still viable, so they could still get pollen on them. As long as they're green and, and growing that light yellow, they're still viable. So what we've got left to pollinate here is about, oh, maybe an eighth of this cob here. So, um, and then we're still in a critical stage, not only because we have to pollinate this bottom or top of the cob, but also this early, early kernel fill period is very critical for moisture. And um, these silks are very delicate. They need a lot of moisture to stay viable. They'll just, they'll fry in hot, dry weather if the, if the plant doesn't have enough moisture. Also, the, the pollen itself can desiccate or just dry up and die under hot conditions. And the, the pollen itself is only viable for a couple hours out in the air. So this pollen that's here on the leaves is probably non-viable pollen. Okay, that's 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 probably dead pollen, basically. Well, dumb question: How does the pollen move up the silk <sighs> at the microscopic level? Yeah, yeah, it it just moves along. It's a it's a hollow tube in there, and it and it just it just moves along. So um, it's moisture. It's not a, it's no, it, it doesn't swim, but right. it's but it, it just moves along with with water pressure and and differences in differences in water levels in the silks as it goes. So, so that's one of the little marvels of nature there. That's why they so. say it's always good to have a rain when your corn is when your corn's pollinating, tossling. They call it a million dollar rain yeah. because yep. Yep. So we've got relatively successful pollination here. Okay. So, so we will move up through this field and we will get to the next replication in this test plot. So hopefully we can see a little better response after I talked up how responsive my plot was. <laughs> this, this area here is not quite as responsive, but that's why we do these plots in multiple replications. So we can get, we can look at different soil types environmental conditions and figure out whether we're you know responsive or not so now my husband from illinois he swore that on the hot nights in the summer you could hear the corn growing sure is that true yeah <laughs> well it's kind of creaking and and groaning as well, it's putting out said. leaves and believe yeah that, but yeah no. you can and so today we're up over 90 degrees this corn is not, it's, right now it's just surviving. So 86 degrees is kind of the cutoff on corn as uh -huh. far as growth and development. It'll slow down drastically over 86. The exception being hybrids bred for southern states have a little bit more heat tolerance than hybrids bred for around here, obviously. Yeah. So, so they'll do a little more growing and developing. So. On a day like today, the corn isn't doing anything now, but as the temperatures cool down at night, then it'll begin to grow a little bit until it runs out of stored up photosynthesis because it's not photosynthesizing at night because there's no sun. So once it cools down below 86 degrees, it'll use up what it's accumulated during the day. Now it's not photosynthesizing much now either. It's just kind of in a, just kind of a, almost a dormant state. So you, you can hear corn creaking at night. So <laughs> okay. yeah, 
Yeah, but it's not like deafening. No. You, know, you got to listen <laughs> pretty awake. close, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, I can't sleep. The corn's growing. <laughs> Okay, so here we have some yellower corn. This is a zero nitrogen area in this plot. And you can see the leaves turn yellow from the inside out, basically, in a V. And this leaf is dead. So what, what this plant is doing is taking nitrogen from this leaf and moving it up the plant to the tassel and the ear leaf and so that the the plant has it's cannibalizing itself okay well, basically this this plant is on Nutrisystem right now it's not getting enough groceries to to grow so it's it's taking it's taking from this leaf and remember the lower leaves don't contribute much to photosynthesis anyway so the plant isn't losing a lot by cannibalizing this leaf to keep the rest of this tissue healthy. And that's one reason why it's not a, a one pound of nitrogen per bushel of yield response because the plants can cannibalize the lower parts of the plant to feed the reproduction of the plant. But uh, obviously if that gets to excess, then we begin hurting yield. So, um, you know, we've got pollination occurring here plants are silked we've got silks we've got tassels um, but it's it's cannibalizing that plant so <clears throat> and as we move through this plot so what we've got is each plot is each replication or treatment is four rows wide 40 feet long so when it comes time to harvest this plot, we'll come in and we'll harvest out the middle two rows, okay? So here's one, two, three, four rows. So we'll hand harvest these middle two rows. We'll keep five foot off of this end, five foot off of the other end, and we'll harvest the middle two rows, 30 feet of those rows. Hand harvest them, shell it, weigh it, adjust it for moisture, and we'll get our yield that way. Okay, so that's how we avoid getting cross contamination. So these these plants here are going, even though they're part of this replication, they're going to be nitrogen stressed because they're trying to share nitrogen with that plot, with that with that treatment there. So. That's why we harvest the middle middle rows. So if you're looking at test plot data on your farm, dig into it a little deeper and find how find out how the plot was done. If if we came in here and we harvested these entire four rows, we would get different results than if we just harvested these middle. And what we want to do is just get the results for this treatment. So that's why we harvest the middle two rows and we do not harvest these outer two rows. So we hand harvest this, then the farmer, our cooperating farmer that's allowed us to use part of his field here, he comes in and he harvests the rest of the crop and then so it doesn't go to waste. But that's how this plot is conducted. So, so we've got statewide research going on right here in, in Trempolo County. Fantastic. Well, boy, it's hot in here. It is. It is. How about we get on out of here? But we can see some some corn cur corn leaves curling here. But also. these are on the edges, and the edges are exposed because yep. you've got and so a yeah, you can through here. Yep, you can see some on in there also. So we're uh, we are drought stressed on this corn too. Now, isn't so. this pretty light soil? It is. Here? It is a. It is a lighter soil. It's. It's a little bit on the sandier side. Technically, it's a silt loam soil, but there's only about two foot of silt loam, and then we go to a sand underneath that because we're not too far from the Trempolo River, and that as that shifted back and forth over the centuries it laid down different layers of sand and stuff so this is a droughty soil if we had clay underneath this or more silt loam it wouldn't be so droughty as as what this but we only got a couple feet out here to store moisture for us so it is a there is a center pivot irrigation system in this field 
but this corner does not get irrigation so that's why we put the plot here because there's a lot of other things we've got to consider if, if it's getting irrigation so this is a dry land plot so it is a little bit of a droughtier soil yep